I want to ask, I'm going to put him on the spot for a moment. I'm going to ask Carly just to share with you a testimony of how he put his faith to work in the last few weeks. We've been talking about faith. We've talked about hope being the image that we have to have, that, that faith is the substance of those things hoped for. And, uh, but faith without works is dead. You know, and sometimes we talk about works and people say, oh, if you don't want to get over into works, you get over into the law. <laughs> if you don't work your faith then you have to understand that, that, that you're actually allowing everything that's not faith to govern your life. You have to put work, faith to work. You, you, it's a rest. Faith is a rest. You enter into that place of faith and you rest in that. You put your energy and attention in entering into faith. Why? Because it works. Because it brings results. You could absolutely exhaust yourself trying to achieve the things that you want and need in your life or you can put the energy that you use in entering into a place of faith and working the faith of God in your life. And I, I want Carly to give you a testimony because what's just happened in his life uh, in the last couple of weeks I believe exemplifies exactly what I believe the Lord is wanting us to learn. So would you go ahead and just, just briefly share what's happened uh, praise and how you God. Used it. Yeah. Praise God. I really sharing this testimony with you this morning um, for the mere fact that that is what really brings the tangibility of our Christianity and what we believe in. And the Bible says, it said, by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony they overcome there's no small testimony i believe as a christian every day god is working a miracle in our life god is doing something tangible in our life you might not see it big but before the eyes of god it's big and you know i decided changing my job the past six months when for reasons i thought i wanted to have a time that would be able to relate more with my family and, and a time to really relate in other things that matters most than just work, work, work. So um, in that uh, light, I decided to go into working for the Australia Post. But uh, before I got into that job, I just thought it was just something that is just as you could just grab um, a letter and dump into a mailbox, but that was not it. It entails a lot of other things you had to learn. That took me to where I didn't imagine because that was my faith. I left my job and resigned my job to get into it. So I went into the training for three months. But here was a boss who chose to train me because no many people want to train people because it takes time and it involves some money. He's going to lose some money in doing that. But this man took his time to train me in three months and by the end of three months, I was going to finish my probation, then now sign up with a contract. And this man came one work one Monday morning, and he said, oh, uh, the whole uh, department we are working here, this zone, uh, due to some errors that has been picked up from your performance, he said, it's like we cannot sign you up. So therefore, your training will just be the end of it. And that was just a big blow on my face that Monday, and I couldn't believe that then. So um, I stood there for a while, then I took my phone and rang my wife. I said, this is what had gone, uh, what had happened. And she hung up on me for a while, and after which she gave me a call again and said, okay, say, well, say, let's just believe God, let's pray over it, I've prayed over it, and, and I think, I said, well, I was just deciding to go back home and just call it, Okay, but he said no. She said no, no, continue the job for the day and finish and come home. So I finished on that Monday and I come back home and I met her and, you know, but I looked at her face, there was not that countenance as if something has really happened because, you know, this, like Pastor said this morning, we don't need to focus on those uh, minor things we don't need to focus on. 
Because God is bigger than every, all of these things. So in the midst of it, I looked at it and said, no. I said, this cannot be true because this is what the devil does. He does that to distract you. He does that to, he, he does that to kill down your family, the finances. These are the areas. We read a story about Job. He does that to a point where his wife said, who is this God you are even serving? You are believing in. I said, we can't get to that point. I have not lost my job. That was what I said. And I went to a scripture that took me to, um, it was Amos, Amos 3.2. He said, can two people work together without being agreed? You know, we cannot work together if we don't come to one ag agreement. And the reason why most of us sign up as partners with this church because we want to work together and agree with whatsoever this church believes and whatsoever this church is leading us to. So I grabbed my wife's hand and I said, let's agree, we've not lost the job. And she, she agreed, we prayed over it. So that was on a Monday, and on a Tuesday morning, I woke up from my work, I woke up from bed, I do what I used to do, dressed up, I said, then she turned around and said, what are you doing? I said, I don't believe I've lost my job, I'm going to work. I said, but where are you going? So we, we were there, and we, she woke up, and I still hanging around there, and uh, yeah, so she, she also do what she did, look after the kids, and after a while, she also dressed up and she jumped into the car with me. So we went out. And I went out and I went to the, because I used to work all the way on the south side. I wake up around about three o'clock in the morning, get ready for four o'clock, five o'clock, then uh, we start operations. And so I run around. Rook, Kupuru, Kupuru area, stone corners. Yeah, so, and, but because that was the training and that was the only place that could afford me this training at an easier, an easy entry into the job. So then I went, I decided to now come that day on the Tuesday, drive to a place called Northgate, which is the mailing center for the whole of this north. And I went to this place and I went and stood at the gate. And this vehicle was coming in, you know, those post, postal uh, service uh, vehicles for the post office, bringing mails in to be distributed. Then I just went there, stopped the man at the gate. I said, um, please, I say, can I just uh, have a word or two with you? He said, oh, what it is? He said, I, I look, I said, I'm a trained man. I'm a postal service man. I could do delivery. I've been trained, but I've just, haven't got a contract for now. Can you offer me a contract? He said, oh. He said, but uh, sorry, I'm not the right person to talk to. He said, can you see the manager? But in fact, have you got an appointment with him? I said, no, I haven't got an appointment. But in my heart, I knew I've got an appointment with Jesus. <laughs> so I know. That. Yes. I said, okay, I do have an appointment with him. He said, okay, all I could do, advise you to do, go to the gate. He said, there is a button there. You press it. Someone will talk to you through the speaker and explain to him as you've just told me. So I got to the gate and I pressed the button and someone said, who is that? I said, I introduced myself. I told him exactly what I told him, uh, that I, I am a trained uh, man who can deliver, uh, um, could do this delivery and, and I need a contract. So okay, come in. I got in and then he interviewed me and then he asked me the same questions and I told him the same thing. He took a pen and paper, he wrote someone's name and a number, so you give a call to this man. And I came back out and I said, I came and then my wife was seated in the car and I said, ooh, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> then we sat at the, then we looked at the number, we looked at the name, I said, okay, let's pray before I give a call. We sat in the car again, we prayed over this uh, paper and the name they gave me, then I took my phone and I called someone and someone answered. They said, what it is? Then I explained to him again the same thing I told the man. So, okay. On the, you come on the Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock, see me at my office. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, I dressed up, I got into my van, I drove to this place, and that is uh, just at the back of us here, Banjo. Banjo? Yeah, yeah Banjo. That's how they call the place. So I got there, 8 o'clock, and I said, a man approached me again and said, what are you after? I said, oh, I'm after a man called Mr. Wesley. Then this man grabbed my hand and said, okay. I took him to the place, uh, he took me to the place where was upstairs. 
They go there and say, oh, I've brought you one man. This man is an African man. He has been deported from Africa. And <laughs> Australia said they need him. And that's why he's here before you this morning. It was just a joke. And they all crack. And we all laughed over it. And <laughs> yeah, so, so what is it, young man? And I also explained to him, as I've told him before, so he said, okay, he took my particulars and everything. He said, okay, you go. I uh, will get to all the guys here who might need someone. And, and then I went. And on a Friday evening, I was praying around 5.30 to 6. Then I had a, a, a phone call. And I picked that phone call. He said, you are Kali. I said, yes. He said, you don't need to tell me who you are. I know you are. He said, I am John. I was the man who, who held your hand, led you to the man who spoke to you. He said, you are after a job. Then come on Monday and start off with me at this time. And on Monday morning, I was right there. God there started something. And I've been there now. This is the second week. Everything is going on. Everything is moving to his glory. And everything just changes. My timing of waking up to go to this place has changed. The distance has changed. And I believe greater things are also going to change. And that's what it is this morning. When you call in the name of the name, the king of kings, as pastor said this morning, the name that is above all names, things change. Because he said we have the power to command the heavenly blessings to open the, every door that is shut here on earth. Because that name, which is above all names, is in charge. He's on the throne. Thank you. Bless you. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? So it's a natural, practical application of faith. Because you've got two choices. You can, you can sit there and get down in the dumps and oh me, oh my. And that's not going to get anywhere. Or you can... You can Get a hold of what you know to be the truth, which is that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. He's, he's outworking these things for our good. Uh, you know, listen, Carly was getting up, he had to get up three o'clock in the morning to get all the way down to the south side. This has turned out so much better. So much better. But he had to do something with his faith. And if he had a good wife next to him, praise the Lord. You know, behind every great man is an even better woman, they say. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> well, no, there's it's there's true because there's there's a partnership. You walk this path together, and uh, and we encourage one another. And the same within a with a family of God like this, when one's uh, struggling, when one's coming under pressure, the others come around. But you know what? You've you've got to be around the others to to get that faith around you. You can't be isolating yourself and, and, and then wonder why you're staying discouraged. You've got to get around faith, get around people who, who are not just happy about reading it in the Bible, but happy about being a doer of the Word. So I wanted you to hear that testimony because that is just a very, very uh, practical example of exactly how you don't put up with, with lack or loss. But you take a hold of the Word of God, believe on the name of Jesus, and you find yourself uh, standing uh, by faith and seeing the heavens open before you. Uh, you know, and now we believe in God for a, a van, uh, the right van, aren't we, Carly? Because Carly's got the, uh, you know, this contract. He needs a van that's a certain years old. He's not the one that puts it in your letterbox. Is it? We're talking about, it's, it's a step before that where it gets distributed, the contract distribute the mail around to the, to the posties and so forth. Uh, but he needs to, uh, we're looking for a specific van, it's, it's got to be within a, under a certain um, a number of years old and so forth, and, and, and well the first van anyway. There might be, I mean how many contracts does, does, does Car can Carly believe for? How many, you know, subcontractors does he want? You know? You know what I'm saying? There's no limit to this. We do it as the Lord directs us. We don't get presumptuous about it. But you've got to see what, what it is. Eventually, you know, who knows what the Lord wants to do. But we, we, we've got to be people of faith, not on a Sunday and get all excited about the message, but on Monday morning, pick up the message and put it to work in our lives. Because I tell you something, he's in far more rest now by faith 
than he would have been stressing about where I'm going to get a job from. Sitting at home, oh Lord, you know, I've lost my job. That's not going to get him anywhere. I haven't lost my job. Because you weren't employed in the first place. You're deployed by God. You've got to be deployed by God. Praise the Lord. So I want to encourage you in that and, 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 uh, and with that testimony, that's a wonderful thing. And, and I'm sure there's many others in this room. We, I'm sure we could have time. We, we had a, the men's uh, get-together, men of excellence got together yesterday morning and we started to have testimonies and uh, we ran out of time, didn't we? I mean, we just, the testimonies started to flow about the great things that God's doing. And, you know, Peter was given a testimony of the wisdom of God and, on him in a business scenario uh, that, that he just needed and God just spoke through his mouth and brought wisdom uh, in a situation that just brought the peace of God. It's wonderful. Why? Because we're putting our faith to work. Praise the Lord. So, I want to talk to you this morning. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to minister to you, to you this morning about developing faith. Developing faith. Um, now, this scenario will only work for perhaps a few more years while people remember it. And you talk to somebody that's maybe under 30 and they may not even know what I'm talking about in terms of developing a, a camera film. Uh, you know, you, it's hard to even find camera film these days. But when you go into, uh, when you take a photograph with the old camera films, uh, it had to be developed in a dark room. Had to be developed. Uh, and now the, the the image is there on the paper, but there is a process of chemicals that brings that image into focus, brings it into a clarity, brings all the pixels. You know, well not pixels actually. But I don't know what they were with the with the old photographs. But anyway, the, there's lots of little tiny dots. There's there's this image comes into into focus, and it is developed. The, the image is already there on the paper. It's, it's not like paint by numbers where you add a little bit. You get the whole package on, on there right there, but it's got to be developed. Uh, and I want us to understand something. We're going to Mark 11 again. We need to understand how to develop our faith because sometimes what we do is, is we, we want a microwave version. <laughs> we want a microwave instant version of stuff. Now, God does the suddenlies. Don't get me wrong. God will do suddenlies in your life. But, but what enables the atmosphere of your life to be ready for these suddenlies? You can't short-circuit faith. We've got to do what God has instructed us to do. I, I tell you, I've tried it. Have any of you tried to short-circuit the principles, <laughs> principles of faith in your life? Try to go from A to sort of a, you know, uh, P? <laughs> you know, just jump across? And, and you've missed out a whole bunch of stuff. And we prosper and are in health, the Bible says, even as our soul prospers. So the process, sometimes the process is just as important as the destination, the journey, the process. What you walk through and are trained in and grow in and strengthen in on your way to the answer. I'm not saying God's making problems in your way. What he does is he helps you by faith and through the word of God to overcome the issues and when you get to your destination, you've grown so much more. You've grown. Praise the Lord. Mark 11, 22. Are we there? So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God or have the faith of God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Well, we've read that, uh, those verses, a number of times in the last few weeks. Um, and I want to study, I want us to come together and study now from yet another angle and ask the question, what develops our faith? What develops our faith? Mark 11, 22, we see the answer. Jesus says these words, have faith in God, or have the faith of God. And then he says what? For assuredly, I say to you. He's answering the question straight away. How do you have faith or the faith of God? How do you get it? How does it come? He is immediately demonstrating the answer. I say to you. The word of God, spoken, preached, coming to you, is the answer to how you have the faith of God to start with. It's also the answer as to how to develop it. Jesus never gives an instruction without the empowerment to fulfill the instruction. 
in fact, if you think about it, the empowerment is in the instruction. Because when God gives an instruction, the instruction is his word. And the instruction being his word it contains the empowerment, the blessing, the substance of faith to be able to fulfill that word. Praise God. All right. So let's go over and look at Romans chapter 10. And we, this, many of you will know this. The process of faith outworked in the very beginnings of faith. See, faith doesn't start until you get born again. You may believe some things. You may consciously... Uh, or subconsciously uh, uh, lean towards uh, understanding some things or believing some things. But the, 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 the difference between a soulish belief structure, uh, a soulish belief, a soulish faith, if you like, a natural human faith, and supernatural faith is that one happens and develops in the soul arena and one happens and develops in the spirit. And if you try soul faith on things, you're going to get yourself frustrated. But if you learn how, how your soul prospers and is developed and is, is, uh, comes up in a place of spiritual faith, because again, you can have natural faith, you can go sit on a chair over there and you have a natural faith that is calculated that that thing will hold me up if I sit on it. That's just a calculus based on physical senses and, 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 and evaluation. But supernatural faith comes from a place of supernatural hope, which is the image that God gives you based on the Word of God. And, and it's released by His own words, just like this universe came into existence by the belief, heart, picture, hope of God released out of His mouth, the substance formulated matter. That's how it came into existence. So Romans chapter 10 explains that very first process uh, of faith in our lives. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who, bring, who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You cannot get faith, you cannot get faith, or you, ca you cannot get saved watching a miracle. You, you cannot, if you turn the television on and there's a miracle service and you see someone's arm grow back in front of your eyes on the TV but the volume's down and you don't hear the gospel preached, you can't get saved on that. You can't get saved on that. There's got to be something that initiates uh, and, and speaks that comes into your spirit. Now I'm not, not necessarily just talking about hearing with the ears. We'll, we'll, we'll get in there and talk about that in a moment, because the Lord can speak to you on the inside, but primarily the, the, the beginnings of faith, the beginnings of this process comes by you hearing. So how can someone get saved? How can someone believe unless they hear someone preach the Word of God? And so the context of Romans chapter 10 is not just the written Word of God that you read, but the preached Word of God that you hear. There's a process that God has put in there. Why? Because he's, he's trying to and, and explain to us, wants us to understand that it's not through the eye gate that faith comes or is developed. It's through the hearing. It's through the hearing that faith comes and is understand. Faith comes by hearing. It doesn't come by seeing or tasting or smelling or touching. You don't need a 4D experience. <laughs> Sometimes people are like, you know, I just want to see an angel. Or God, if you would just write on the wall for me. Or, you know, people are trying to get God to do these supernatural things. You've heard me say it before. You can try and chase the spectacular and miss the truly spe uh, supernatural. Now, we want, we want the word of God. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are those who have believed and yet not seen. Not been uh, dependent on the physical circumstances. All right. The only physical sense that is connected to the function of receiving faith is hearing 
And even this is not so much tied to the act of physical hearing, but hearing itself is dependent on the content. Let me explain that to you. Um, Faith comes by hearing, but how does hearing come? By the Word of God. So faith comes by hearing, but hearing comes by the Word of God. So unless it's the Word of God, you're not really hearing. You can be discerning syllables and sounds and concepts through words, but it's still based and developed only in the soul realm. But when the Word of God is spoken, you go to a different level of hearing, truly hearing, hearing the Word of God. And faith doesn't come by a soul processing words and sounds. Faith comes by a spirit receiving and believing the Word of God. So faith comes by hearing, but not any hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. Okay? Hearing the Word of God. So, you know, there's people out there, there's the ecumenicalism. And ecumenicalism used to mean all of the different churches. Now what ecumenicalism means out there is all the religions. You know, every, every path leads to God. That's not true. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's a lie. That's a lie. So, what we have to understand is that when we listen to the Word of God, we truly start to hear, spiritually speaking. Now, you might think that you get more faith than you have uh, if you hear the Word more. <clears throat> That's not necessarily what it's saying. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Okay, if I hear the Word more, I'll get more faith. No, that's also not quite accurate. And we need to understand this because sometimes people will, will get a concept of that and they, they, what happens out in the church world at times is people think that there are the special people who get more faith and then there's the not quite so special people, which is usually the category people put themselves in, who don't get quite as much faith. Which means if we're really going to pray and get something done, I'm going to have to go over to here to this special person and get them to pray. Now, I understand that, that there are uh, authorities and there are governments and there are things that God has placed in the church. There, is a five, there are fivefold ministries within the church. Now, why, why does the fivefold ministry exist in the church? The apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and evangelist. It's not for the apostle or the, or the prophet or the pastor or the teacher, the evangelist, to, go, to be doing all the work. Their commission is not to the world. You understand? My commission as a pastor, as a teacher of the Word of God, is not to the world. My commission is to you. To train you to go to the world. Amen. Amen. So, so there is a, a training that should go on in here for you to get a revelation of the faith that you have, which is world-changing faith. So you don't need to go to the pastor to pray for your situation just because he's the pastor. That would be a wrong concept. Now you might go to the pastor to help train you to pray or get into agreement with your prayer, but you could do that with any other faith-believing, Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-empowered, name of Jesus, Christian. Amen. Uh, sometimes people pull on me a little bit and, and I'm hesitant at times. Would you come and pray for this or would you come and pray for that? Yeah, I will, but not because you can't. Does that make sense? We, we've got we've to allow ourselves to come up in a place of like precious faith. Peter said this, and, and Peter described it and he declared it. He said, it's not just because I was on Jesus' personal staff that I can do these things. But we've all got like precious faith. It's the same kind of faith that I have, that you have, that anybody else has. Jesus walked around with, uh, Peter walked around with Jesus, and then he was there as, a, as really the head of the church at the beginning of the church. And yet he said, I've got the same kind of faith that you've got, or any other person that's been born again. 
We've got to see the empowerment of the body of Christ. It's not about build, building little kingdoms and ministries. God will call us into ministries and there, are, there is value in the fivefold because if there's no fivefold, then the church will not be built up the way it's supposed to be. So we value and understand the whole part of what God has called us to do. But it's not that you've got certain people called to the ministry who do all the ministry. Their ministry is to the sheep, to the church. I mean, you don't, you don't, you know, you, 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 a shepherd doesn't try to grow wool. <laughs> yeah, the shepherd has sheep that grow the wool. And he looks after them and cleans the dags off. And <laughs> Anyway, Romans chapter 12, let's go there. If you don't know what a dag is, you can look it up later. <clears throat> so you, you might think that you get, the more you hear the words, you'll get more faith. But that's not the case, because if that were the case, then the initial dose <laughs> that you got would, might, might vary between that person and the special person. <laughs> now let's look at this, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Now for I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. soberly. Now the same thing would go this way. Don't think less of yourself than you ought to think either. Do you know what true humility is? True humility. I'm not talking about false humility. A lot of people who try to, who try to be humble get over into an area of false humility, which in itself is pride because it draws attention to itself. Humility... True humility is this, agreeing with what's true, nothing more, nothing less. Agreeing with what's true. And if God says to you, you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you, it's not pride to stand up and say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's humility, because it agrees with the truth. Now, unfortunately, what's happened in some cultures and Australia is one of those cultures, one of the things that has formulated, and this is not Australian, because what God says for Australia is Australian, this is one of the things that has developed out of a, a, a demonic infiltration of culture, is the tall poppy syndrome. Where if somebody starts to rise up a little bit, they're cut down to size rather than speaking life and encouragement and actually endorsing and encouraging someone to rise up and be all God's called them to be. No, we, don't, we, don't, we, we are a kingdom culture. This nation, this nation should be formed, the culture of this nation, touched by what God has destined for this nation. Praise the Lord. I love that. I don't know if you've seen that latest McDonald's ad with the country guy that goes, you know, the country burger. Have you seen that? And he's, he walks into the McDonald's and he says, G'day, hi, how are you? And he's saying hello to everybody. And then he eats his country burger and on the way out the door he's like, See you later, everybody. You know, it's like, it's just such a, it's just such a personable thing, you know, rather than the city and nobody cares who, who, who's around, you know. Huh. Yeah. See, see there, there's good things. There's great things about, about this. And we, take up, we pick up the good things of, of God that he's planted in this nation. And we, we reject the counter heaven culture things. See, faith to every man, to God has dealt to each one the measure or a measure of faith. It's not variable measures. How do I know that? Because we go in and we study the word. What does it mean? See, when you were born again, when you were born again, your spirit took on the DNA of the Father. You got his DNA. You were born of him. The, the New Testament says, since we are the offspring of God, we got his DNA. Faith, the Bible says, is like a mustard seed. All right. Well, contained within a mustard seed. How do you grow a mustard seed? How would we grow a mustard seed into a tree? We'd take that mustard seed and we'd plant it. Now, do we need more mustard seeds to make that mustard seed grow into a tree? No. Will, that, will that mustard seed grow better if we daily sprinkle more mustard seeds? 
Can we say, I need more mustard seeds to make my mustard seed grow? No. Faith is like a mustard seed. You don't need more faith sprinkled on your faith to make your faith work or, or develop. You just need to develop the faith you have. The mustard seed needs to be nourished, planted, watered, nurtured, fertilized, and it grows into a tree which produces more. All right, well, faith is the same, the same way. The word here that God has dealt to each one the measure of faith, here in the, in the middle of this, uh, the, the word measure is the word metron, which is where we get the word meter from. It's a specific amount. It's not a variable. So you could actually quite accurately translate, God has given to each one a meter of faith. <laughs> now if it helps you to understand that, read it that way. Because all of a sudden now you see it's not just a measure variable, it's a measure specific. Each one got a measure, the measure, one type of measure of faith. So you don't pray, God, give me, I need more faith today. He's already given you the, the mustard seed that's there. He's already planted in you faith. That's what you got, a measure. It's, it's specifically measured out. It's not random. God doesn't throw some faith at you and hopefully some of it will stick. No, see, the, one of the wonderful things about God is that he's no respecter of persons. He, he doesn't, you know, look at you and say, well, I'm going to, you know, put this much faith on you. Billy Graham, oh, he's got this much faith. Kenneth Copeland, oh, he's got this much faith. Me, I've just got a little bit. No, you, you, what that is, actually, 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 actually maligning God and saying he, he's undervalued you regarding faith. Now, what happened happens with people that we think are, or, or, or would say are heroes of the faith, is that these people have developed and used their faith. Why did Carly have, have a breakthrough and see some things work in his life? Because rather than sit there and mope, he put his faith to work. There was enough development that had already gone on with what he believed in his faith and the substance on the inside of him that it was able to come out of his mouth and his feet were able to get, him, get himself dressed for work and go somewhere believing the favor of God on his life. Hallelujah. That's how it works. I use the word develop specifically in the title of the message. Like I said earlier, when a, a, photo, a photographer used to develop film. Um, the image is already there. The hope is already there. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the, the image developed of the image implanted. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Oh, it does me good to preach on faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 8, a sower went out, verse 5, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and it, and it, uh, with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried out, Now listen, he who has is to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him, saying, what does this parable mean? And he said, to you it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it's given in parables, that they seeing they may not see, hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. Now, a number of times Jesus, in the scriptures, the, Jesus uses the words, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, first of all, we need to understand that he's not, he's not sort of suspecting that within the crowd and the congregation that he has, there's a few people there that don't have any ears. <laughs> there's not sort of earless people in the, in the crowd. He, you know, those of you that don't have ears, you're not going to, you know, <laughs> no. So what does he mean? He means those of, who, those of you that have ears 
that will hear what I'm saying on a level that goes beyond just natural comprehension. Those who will hear on a level that receives it. Those who hear on a level that will allow it to now formulate and change your life so that you now are doers of what I'm about to show you. Not just people that hear, because we all hear in our ears, but we don't all hear. Amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, Jesus says that he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The parable explains that the same seed is sown on all of those different pieces of ground. Is the word that doesn't produce a hundredfold any less powerful than the word that produced a hundredfold? No. The word was not the, the, the factor that differentiated or, or, or um, varied. The word was the same word. He didn't have a, a number of different buckets of word, of seed. And in this ground he sowed a lesser kind of seed, and on this ground he sowed a, a better kind. That's not what it says. It was the same bucket, the same barrel, the same seed that was spread. The, di the thing that differed was the ground. Where you are positioned and conditioned matters. Where you are positioned and conditioned. The people by the wayside, they're fringe dwellers. Well, what happens at the wayside? That's where people walk. The ground's too hard to plant anything there. If you hang around on the edges, you're walking on tough ground. That's the exit row. <laughs> Faith doesn't develop in the exit row. I like the exit row on an aeroplane because it gives me more leg room, not because I think I'm going to need to get out of that plane quicker than anybody else. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's ground or people's lives that sometimes are filled up with rocks. It's hard for the, it's hard for the Word of God to take root in those lives. There's some people's lives have, have had so much other stuff sewn into it that it's all weedy and it chokes that word that's trying to produce. The word will be trying to produce in your life regardless. It's the same word. It's the same seed. But it does matter how we're positioned and conditioned. It does matter that we present, present ourselves as in a place and, and, and in a way that, that is, enables the Word of God to prosper in our lives. It does matter. It does matter what we do with the Word of God. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 and, and look at this briefly. Hebrews 4, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, remember this from last week? Let us feel as any of you seem to have come short of it. We don't want to come short of the rest that God has given us by grace to enter into. Verse 2, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So is it possible for the word of God to not prosper? Yeah, we've already seen it twice now. It can go into some ground and not produce the kind of harvest it's designed to. It can be in a person's life and not prosper, not bring about salvation because it was not mixed with faith in the person who heard it. All right, but let's go to Mark chapter 7 and see something else. Mark 7, verse 11. And Pastor Chris, you're showing us all the things where faith, how faith won't work. Well, sometimes it's important to see those things to identify these things in our lives. Mark chapter 7. Verse 11, but you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profits you might have been received from me as Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Making the word of God, listen to this, of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down and many such things you do. So the word of God can actually be of no effect by tradition. Well, that's an interesting thing. In fact, that's a, that's a terrible thing to think about. The tradition will actually stop faith in its works. So it will stop the word in its tracks. Both of these scriptures indicate that just because we are given the creative, powerful word of God doesn't mean it will override us and make our lives submit and line up. We have to hear it. We have to believe it. 
We have to receive it. We have to act on it. We have to speak it. We have to declare it. We have to sow that seed that we received ourselves. We, we, are, we are seed sowers. We're producers of what God has planted in our lives. Faith comes by hearing. But how does hearing come? By the Word of God. Many people hear the Word of God but don't hear. You must receive it as the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the first thing is you have to, when you hear it, you have to agree and believe and receive that it is God's Word. It's not just a leather-bound book of principles and concepts, even though those principles and concepts do work and they are great. It is breathed by God. It is Spirit-empowered on the inside. And if you listen and hear it any other way, you're just listening to concepts and principles and you'll end up in a place of religion or tradition. There's a fine line. There is such a fine line at times between discerning walking in a place of tradition and religion and because they look so similar. But one is soul and one is spirit. And there's, the, there's only one way to discern and cut and divide between soul and spirit. What is it? The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between soul and spirit and bone and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hallelujah. So when we listen to these words and I discern and I declare, that's God breathing to me. That's God speaking. Those words are con- contain the blessing on the inside of them. I receive them as such. It's not just a principle that I have to obey. It's a relationship that I'm empowered through. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's God breathed. So go back to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. If you're not hearing the word of God, you're not hearing if you're not hearing it as as the Word of God, you're still not hearing. Mark 4, verse 24. Um, So this is coming after the parable of the sower now. Um, It says this, Take heed what you hear. He said to them, Take heed what you hear. So it's not just about hearing any old stuff. You actually have to be choosy about what you put into your ears. Jesus is saying, listen, take heed what you hear. And some people, every now and then one of my children will be listening to a song or something and I say, oh, turn that off. I say, yeah, but dad, it's a Christian song. I say, I'm sorry, that is not a Christian song. Yeah, yeah but they're a Christian group. <laughs> I know some preachers that I won't listen to. Now, I'm not going to say any names here. But what, what the concept of saying, just because someone said, labels it Christian doesn't necessarily mean it's got the content of God's breath in it. Does that make sense? Without me sounding too critical, you know, turning off, oh, what's that? Oh, well, it's a Christian radio station. It's not. If it's not playing spirit-filled content. Well, what's that? That's a, that's a Christian political party. No, it's not. (laughs) You know, sometimes we're now calling things family friendly. You know? I'll be careful what what I'm saying here. I don't want to say anything too specific. Uh, I think you figure out what I'm saying here. Praise the Lord. God be God breathed. Tradition and religion are very similar. Tradition often starts... Tradition often starts simply with a man's idea. It continues on. Um, Whereas religion often begins with a God idea. But then it's continued by man when God doesn't want it continued. Religion begins the second time you do something God told you to do once. People are predisposed to like tradition and to like religion. Not Not all traditions are bad. Well, I've said to you before, we, we like waffles on a Saturday morning. That's not a bad tradition. That's a fun tradition. We like that tradition. 
but it doesn't cut across the Word of God. See? But there are traditions that you can have in your life that you obey or that you submit to or that, that, that directs your life more than the Word of God does. And Jesus rebuked him. He said, listen, you're, you're trying to use religious sounding words like korban or dedicated or offerings and so forth, but actually in the way that you're fu- handling that, in the way that you're functioning that, you're cutting right across the principle, the heart of God, which is to look after your parents. And he said, this moment you try to use religion as a way of getting out of giving or a way of looking at, at not looking after your parents, you've cut right across the principle and the heart of God. And the word of God that is a blessing to you will not work in your life because of that tradition. Now we've got to position ourselves and condition ourselves to be doers of the word, to to see our faith develop. So verse 25, let's look at it again. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But to whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now don't mix yourself up and think God's going to, if I don't use the word, God's going to take it away from me. If you go to the beginning, if you find out who's the one trying to take the word away from you, it's not the Father. The devil comes, how? Immediately to try to take away the word. Verse 15, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. But you've got, to he- you've got to heed what you do here and you've got to put it to use so that you use it. How many of you have ever learned a second language? Many of you in this room speak a second language. Some of you speak French or, or uh, an African language or, or, or Afrikaans maybe or, or something. And you, speak, and you may have learned English as a second language. After a while, somebody can speak to you in a language that you grew up with And it takes you a moment to register to try to, oh, yes, um, and try to find the words to speak if you haven't spoken it for long enough. If you don't use it, you you can lose it to some degree. And the word's the same way. You can get a great message on Sunday and be filled and, and, and just, just, just strong in that concept. And, 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 you know, but if you, don't, if you don't allow that to keep coming into your ears, because faith doesn't come by having heard. Past tense. Faith comes by hearing, not having heard. Do you remember what Brother Copeland said? That the memory of a potato doesn't fill your stomach. If you want a potato, you have to eat a potato. You can't dwell on the memory of how it tasted. It's the same with the Word of God. It's the same with the Word of God. We eat. And we continue to eat. Remember, you know, one of, the th- one of the concepts that we have to understand, Hebraic concepts that are important to us here, that which I think we've, we've lost to some degree, is when God instructed and gave the word of God to Moses and then to the children of Israel and passed down through these faithful prophets of God and into the hands of, of, of the church now, and, and we've got these testaments and with these words and these, God, these God-breathed words. When God gave this, he did not give it to us to just read quietly. The Hebraic concept of the Word of God is that these are words to put in your mouth, not just in your ears and not just in your eyes. Yes, they go in your ears, but how do they go in your ears? You, don't, you can't get something from your eyes to your ears. You can get something from your mouth to your ears. If you read it, even just in terms of a, a cognitive process, even just in terms of the natural process, if you read something with your eyes, you're using one sense. What happens the moment you open your mouth and read? Three, your mouth is also now moving. It's now processing. The mouth is processing physically. The ears are hearing audibly. The eyes are seeing visually. You've now tripled your intake just by opening your mouth. And so when God says to Joshua, he says to, when, to Joshua about the book of the law, he says, it shall not depart from your mouth, not from your eyes. We might naturally think he would say, don't let it depart from your eyes. In other words, meditate it, look at it, see it. He says, no, the way you really meditate on it day and night is putting it in your mouth. Why? Because faith comes from God by hearing him speak and faith is processed and used by you also speaking. You put his word in your mouth, it's a two-edged sword. Remember, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged. The Greek word is literally two-mouthed swords. You look it up, it doesn't say two-edged. It, the two words, two compounding Greek words say uh, two, uh, uh, the word for two, die, and, and mouth. Why? Because God speaks it, you speak it. 
That's how faith works. That's how the word of God does not come back void. Praise the Lord. So it won't depart from your mouth. Praise the Lord. Let's go to James chapter 1 and we'll finish here. James chapter 1. See, how do we develop our faith? By, having hear, by hearing the word. Not having heard the word, hearing the word. You need to take every spare moment that you've got. You, you, should, have, you should have the word being preached in your car. You should have it on your iPod, on your phone. You should, you should have it, you know, if you truly want to develop your faith in areas... You don't get more faith. You don't get more muscles the more you work out. You develop your muscles. Faith is the same. Your spiritual faith muscle is the same. You work it out. You feed it with the word of God. Praise the Lord. You open your mouth and you feed on the word. James chapter 1. Verse 21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness, what? The implanted word. The word does not come through your intelligence. Revelation, that's how, that's how information comes. Revelation comes implanted. When you're listening to the word of God being preached, your brain is, is processing a small percentage of what you're hearing. Now, you can increase that, like I said, through t- touch. And, you know, if I, if I got you all to stand up and say something, you would remember that more than me just saying it. And where's there's things you can do when you're teaching on, in the natural like that. Information, information comes that way. But revelation is imparted. Every, let me tell you something. Every single word that the Holy Spirit has breathed through this message... Every single part of it you got, 100%. And you didn't even have to try to because your spirit automatically receives 100% of everything God breathes through the preached word. Because your spirit doesn't know how to not receive 100%. It's in unison with the Holy Spirit. So so sometimes people say, I've got it up here, I've just got to get it from here down to here. I've got to get it from my head to my heart. No, that would be the wrong process. According to the Bible, the Word of God is implanted. So you actually receive it here. Now, meditating the Word, Hebraically speaking, is getting it from here to here. It comes this way. You meditate it until you renew your mind. And too many times we've tried to, we've tried to allow the Word of God to change our lives through the soul to the Spirit when that's the wrong process. It's the Spirit to the soul. So how do you do it? You hear, and you hear, and you hear, and you hear. Oh, I can tell you, the first I got the, my first tapes of Kenneth Copeland that I got. And I don't just listen to Kenneth Copeland. But the first time I heard someone preach this kind of stuff on faith was a set of tapes by Kenneth Copeland. I plumb all those things out. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I had a little a walk, a cassette Walkman thing, and I just had those things going over and over, and I'm in the bank. And I'm not listening to the teller. I'm, I mean, it looked probably a bit rude, but I'm listening to this word until, it, until it, grew, it, it grew up out of my spirit and changed my process of thinking and some things started to click in my brain, not because I was working on it cognitively, but because I was working on it spiritually. But you cannot short change the process of hearing. You've got to hear it. And it, listen, guys, it's not enough to come and hear an hour on Sunday morning or an hour and ten or whatever it is we spend this morning. It's not enough. Some say, well, couldn't you cut your sermon down to 20 minutes? We'd all get off to lunch a whole lot quicker. <laughs> Jesus said, well, can, well, can you not watch for an hour? <laughs> I mean, how, how long's an hour, really? It's not. We'll watch, sit and watch a, te- a, a movie for three hours. And, and so forth. This is life. This is life. This is what makes the difference between being employed and being non-employed. This is what makes the difference between living and dying of cancer. It is. Isn't it, Faye? I, we stood next to and watched Faye walk a, a life of faith when cancer tried to, to eat away at her body and she was in there praising God and witnessing to the nurses because the Word was working in her life. 
And she's alive today. I know it because of the Word of God. This is life and death. And not only for what values us and what keeps us in this room, but for for us to be filled with this message, to go out and find people who are filled and riddled with cancer and find people who don't have a job and give them the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. But we can't shortchange the process of how we develop our faith here in this place or we won't be effective out there in that place. It does matter what you hear. I'm not saying you can't ever watch a movie on TV. I can't say don't ever listen to the news or stuff, although that, if you listen to the news, you're going to have to get into your Bible straight after because it's just a bunch of lies. There's some, there's some, I'd rather turn on Braveheart and watch that than watch some of the news, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can get more out of that than I can get out of the news. Half the time the news only tells you what has happened anyway. But we do need to be in the place of prayer. We do need to be in a place and we need to be listening to the Word of God. I want to encourage you. Listen, we don't, you know, Mark works hard at getting uh, uh, the Word of God recorded and onto radio broadcasts, uh, onto, the, onto iTunes, uh, onto CDs if you need them, uh, MP3, you know, whatever way. And, and George, you know, is producing them on, onto the YouTube and Vimeo now on the, on the visual side of things. We're not doing all that just because we, we think we're pretty special if we've got stuff up online. The whole point of that, the whole point of that is, is for people to have an access to the Word. You know, in the, new, in, the, in, in, in the book of Acts, they daily gathered together and devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, to fellowship and the apostles' teaching. Why? Because they couldn't download it on Monday. So the only way they're going to hear it again is to make a journey down to where the apostles were who were repeating the stuff and going over it and over it again all week so they could get in there and hear it. How much better, how much easier do we have it? You You can download it, usually by Wednesday night on the audio, usually by Monday the video's up. You can download that, put it on your iPod, put it on your phone, on the way to and from work, lunchtime, whatever it takes, and, and develop your faith. Hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, until it's spilling out of your mouth. You know, it's, it's not so much just grabbing any old word from God's word that will fix the, the situation or the moment you're in. It's taking hold of the word the specific rhema of God that the Holy Ghost brings up in your heart at that moment. And if you're not hearing the word, he's got nothing, he can't reach out and recall that for you if you haven't already got it in there. He brings to your remembrance. But it's got to come up out of a place where it's already been planted. And sometimes when you're hearing it, you know, those, those message, those tapes I've listened to and I didn't, it, didn't, it didn't really explode into my spirit, and from my spirit into my mind, that process. I heard it, I heard it, I heard it, but it didn't, it didn't break the barrier between here and here until about the sixth time I heard it. And, I, and, and I'm sixth time through, I'm listening to it and it's like, oh my goodness, that wasn't, the, that wasn't on there before. Where did that come from? And it's just like, whoa, man, that's awesome. And I, and I, was, I, I rewind it and go back. And say, it was there all the time, but it just took the sixth time through to break through until it just changed something in my thinking. And now it became a part of my life, my confession, who I am. Oh, we've got to get back to this, folks. We've got to, be, we've got to get back to to how, how, we, how we receive, how we process, how we develop, how we use our faith. Hallelujah. The whole lot is a gift, a grace of God. You don't have to work at God to try to get him to give you your, his word. It's already been given. What you have to do is be diligent to enter into the rest of what that is. You have to t- turn on the tape recorder. MP3 player. I don't know, there'll be something come out in the next few years that'll make all that obsolete as well. But whatever it is that you have, turn it on. I know what you want to go, but I've got another story for you. 
Do you remember, uh, some of you remember this, I, I, was, I needed to get from London, uh, from uh, Australia, New, oh, down here somewhere, no, it was Australia, New Zealand, to England. And I got to Singapore and they cancelled the Qantas flight I was on. And because I was travelling on uh, Qantas staff partner tickets, which meant I was on standby. Um, Linda was working for Qantas at the time and she gave me travel partner status, which meant I could fly to England on business class for $600, which is quite nice. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I'm sitting there in Singapore and they cancelled the Qantas flight and loaded everybody onto a British Airways airline. And I'm sitting there, and I must admit, my, my initial reaction was not positive. I'm sitting there, and I'm in a grump. I'm thinking, man, I don't want to. I mean, if you're going to be stuck anywhere, be stuck in Singapore air, uh, Airport, right? I mean, it's probably the prettiest one in the world. But I'm sitting there. Anyway, I'm sitting in this seat, and I'm, I'm watching this movie on, on a flat screen on the wall. And it was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or something like that. <laughs> I'm sitting there, and I'm having a grump session. Now, I know none of you have ever done this. You've never sat there and had a grump. But I'm sitting there having a grump session. I'm like, oh, I don't need to go on that plane. I don't want to spend all night in the airport. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak up on the inside of me. What are you doing? It was not a rebuke as much as just a, a, just a pull on the slack out. It was like, what are you doing? Um, complaining? <laughs> I want to get on the airplane. I don't want to be stuck in an airport. He said, well, that's not how you're going to get on this flight. And immediately what came up in my spirit was something that Linda had said to me. She just in passing, just sometimes that you know some of those some of the Qantas employees go jump jump seat because because what happens was I went to the counter and they said well, the whole plane's been cancelled. Everyone's been unloaded on uh, on onto this one, and now the plane is over full, and there's a whole stack of people that won't get on this plane tonight, and so you're not getting on because you're on standby. <laughs> And, and so the Lord said, you know, what are you doing? And I, and I thought, so he said, now put, put a tape on. So I, in my bag I had actually Creflo Dollar reigning in righteousness is what I had on the tape. And I put that on and I'm listening to that and I'll, I tell you, within about 10, 15 minutes my spirit's starting to fire up. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm a child of God. I'm a son of the living God. I... My, my daddy owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He could buy and sell this airport a million times over. I'm not going to sit here and not get on an airplane. And I'm start, it's firing up on the inside of me. And all of a sudden, I remember this jump seat. Jump seat comes to my mind. Right, that's it. I'm getting on the jump seat. Now, what you've got to understand, this is just after 9-11. So it's going back a few years. This is just after 9 11's happened. So, you know, the airport's full of people with guns and, you know, security's at its tightest it's ever been. So, and I don't have a ticket or anything. So I walk, I walk up to, um, uh, to, the, to the gate and, uh, and I said, uh, when I, w I went to the ticket counter, first of all, and I said, look, I, I'd like jump seat. <laughs> she just laughed at me. She did. This little Singaporean lady, she just laughed at me. She just laughed. She said, what do you, what do you mean? I said, oh, jump seat, oh, jump seat. She said, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. You cannot get jump seat. I said, but I've heard people, yeah, she said, yeah, but there's, there's a whole bunch of things you've got. In fact, you, in fact the, the main thing is you've got to have, per, you've personally got to be approved by the captain. So I said, okay, I'll see you, see you in a bit. <laughs> so I took off down to the gate. I thought, I'm going to go and speak to the captain. I'm a son of the living God. I'm royalty. I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. And this is, he's a captain, great, but I'm a son of God. You know? So anyway, I went wandering off down there and I got to the gate. This is now 15 minutes before the flight's due to fly out. That's all. I mean, they've closed it a long time ago. So I'm there and I said to the guards, you know, uh, can I, uh, I need to speak to the captain. And they said, uh, well, where's your boarding pass? I said, I don't have one. <laughs> and they just looked at me and they just shook their heads. You know, you're not coming in here. So I thought, Lord, what do I do next? So I turned around, and there's the captain. He's running late, all right? See, God works these things. He'll back you up. I don't know how God delayed him, and maybe they got the lift to get stuck for 10 minutes or something. I don't know what it is, but God was orchestrating stuff because I'm by faith working this out in my life now, you see. And so I turn around, there's the captain. I said to the captain, uh, my name's Chris Twin. I'm traveling on Qantas staff. 
tickets. I'm on standby. The, you know the situation with the planes. I really need to get on this plane. I would uh, appreciate it, sir, <laughs> if you would consider allowing me on jump seat. He just looked blank face at me like this. He just looked at me blank. And he said, what's your name? Um, Chris Twin. He got his little book out and wrote it down. Chris Twin. Put it back in his pocket and walked off. I thought, that'll do. That, I'm, that'll do. I raced back down to the counter and I went up to the lady and I said, um, I'd like that jump seat now. She said, yeah, I told you, you can't have it. I said, I've spoken to the captain. He's got his, my name written in his little book and I'm getting on that aeroplane. I want you to pick up the phone. I want you to get someone to pack you through to the cockpit. I want you to speak to the captain. She said, I can't do it. I said, would you just try it for me? She said, anyway, she's really reluctant. Hey, she picked up the phone and did whatever it took and both through it. She said, yes, I've got this guy, Chris. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, then. Thank you. She put the phone down. She looked at me. She said, she grabbed this boarding pass, which I've still got. I think it's in my, if you want to see it afterwards, it, it, it's, in, it's in my Bible case. And, uh, and, and she, grabs this, she grabs this boarding pass and she hands it to me, and she, all it's got written on is Chris Twin, jump seat. And she hands it to me, she says, you better run. <laughs> she cannot believe what's going on. Yeah. So I grabbed the boarding pass, I ran, stopped, phone Jill, said I'm on the plane, ran, <laughs> ran down to the gate, waved this boarding pass at these armed guards, and they're just like in shock, it's like, what is that? <laughs> jump seat, what does that mean? You know, and I walked through, and, any, and I got halfway down towards the, where the gate is, uh, inside where all the people were sitting, or were, they're all on the plane now, well on the plane. And the chief purser comes up and says, excuse me, sir, can I help you? <laughs> He's English, you know, British Airways. And uh, I said, yeah, I've got this jump seat boarding pass. The captain's, you know, authorised me to be on the plane. But he looked at me and says, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> and he takes off down the runway. Anyway, listen, about, literally about two minutes later, he comes back and he says, I'm awfully sorry, sir, follow me. <laughs> Now this, is, this, is the, now, this is the best part, right? He leads me up the gangplank, onto the plane, up the stairs, and into first class. And puts me down in first class. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, this is good. <laughs> is this is good. You know, they come, it's dinner time. You know, a, linen napkins and steak, and uh, this is good. This is really good. And then the Lord, and then I, I just sitting there thinking, dwelling on this and thinking, I had a choice. I had a choice to stay in a grump and sleep on the floor in Singapore airport overnight or put that word into my ears and my heart and, I, and give place for the soil of my spirit to, to bring forth that faith which acted on it. And when I got home, I told Linda, she was in shock. And she went and told her friends at Qantas. They were all in shock. They said, don't tell anybody. That is impossible. The, you, the, all of the security guidelines, everything else, that, that pilot could have been sacked for doing that. I mean, we, we broke every rule in, in, in the Qantas, not God's book, but Qantas book. And, and he just, I mean, it, the security was at its height. It should not have happened to let me on like that, but God, but faith in his word, amen, but God. So I don't care what, I don't care what the situation is that pressing against you, you have a choice. Faith doesn't come by having heard, it comes by hearing. Put the word in your ears, in your heart, allow it to stir up on the inside you, let it come out of your mouth and you stand firm on the word of God as a child of the living God. Amen? Well, I trust that's really encouraging today. Praise God. Father, we want to thank you uh, for your word in our lives. Thank you for this word right now. Thank you for the stirrings on the inside of us. All that you're doing and saying in our lives. Father, we know uh, as blood-bought, blood-washed children of the living God, you've given us a, a commission on this earth to walk out these days by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And Father, I thank you right now, every person in the sound of my voice, even as they're listening right now, 
would allow these words that they've heard preached today to be God-breathed into their spirit, to meditate those things, preach them out in the mirror if necessary to themselves, speak those scriptures out over their lives, over their families, over their business, over their employment, over the things that they know that you've spoken into their hearts for their future. God, let us not try to live on the memory of a word. Let's continue to hear that word over and over, preached, it's declared. And Father, I thank you that, that your word works. Faith works. That grace is working in our lives. The blessing is working in our lives. And we agree with it. We get in line with it. We hear it. And we put it to work in our lives. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.